Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar featuring Gina Martin Adams, CFA and CMT, hosted by the CFA Society of Chicago CFA Women's Network. My name is Samantha Gasal and I manage Bloomberg's business in Chicago, working with asset owners, asset managers, corporations, hedge funds, banks, and broker dealers that leverage our platform for data, analytics, news, research, communication, portfolio management, trade execution, and more. For more information on Bloomberg, please feel free to contact me directly after today's session. Information on upcoming CFA Society events can be found on the Society's website at www.cfachicago.org. All mics for attendees will automatically be muted during the event. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature. This event is being recorded. We will begin the event with remarks from Gina Martin-Adams, the co-chair of the CFA Women's Network, Tiffany Greenhouse, CFA, will then join us to moderate questions from attendees. Gina Martin-Adams is the Chief Equity Strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. She provides top-down perspective on the equity market, sectors and industries with a multidisciplined approach that utilizes fundamental, quantitative, and technical analysis. Prior to joining Bloomberg, she was head of U.S. equity strategy for Wells Fargo Securities, an economist for Wachovia Bank, and an investment strategy analyst for Evergreen Asset Management. Gina holds the Chartered Financial Analyst and Chartered Market Technician designations. Without further ado, please welcome Gina Martin-Adams. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much, Sam, for that kind introduction. Uh, the plan for me is first to share my screen. Believe it or not, I do think that my technology skills have actually deteriorated in the coronavirus shutdowns. Uh, but I'm going to give it a go and let's make sure that I get it to you guys okay. Uh, there it is. Hopefully you see that okay. Um, if not, sorry. <laughs> there we go. All right. So my thought is I'll run through uh, my slide, giving our outlook for the equity market, kind of talking through current dynamics, what we're expecting for the rest of the year, and then open it up to questions. So I would really encourage you to ask questions as we go along, submit your questions. So we have something to talk about, obviously, I could take the whole time rambling on about what I think is important, but I'd much rather hear from you on what you think is important. So let me just dive right in and to stocks in the COVID-19 recession and recovery. Uh, first, just to set the stage for where we are, we're nearly out of the woods. Uh, frankly, we wrote a note on uh, March 25th suggesting that you don't want to wait on fundamentals to confirm a bottom of zin for stocks, but you do want to have a few technical indicators line up and a few intermarket rotations line up to suggest that the bottom is indeed in. The only one we're missing of the several that we highlighted is breadth. Uh, we're now at a point where about 76% as of yesterday, today it was around 83% of S&P 500 members were trading above their 50-day moving average. Recall back in March at the lows, we were less than 1% of stocks trading above that 50-day moving average. That's something that's only happened a handful of times in history and does usually uh, indicate at least the beginnings of a bottoming formation. But what you want to see to confirm that the bottom is officially in is a big breadth explosion to the point where 85% or more our stocks are trading above that 50-day moving average. So we're waiting for that final indicator. Other than that, every indicator that we had identified at that point as likely to signal that March was indeed the major low of this corrective process has occurred. We've seen greater than 50% retracement in stocks. We've seen a greater fit than 50% retracement in the VIX. We've seen rotation into junk, a la low quality, high volatility stocks. We even got a confirmation with rotation into high leverage stocks, as well as small caps over the course of April. We've also seen uh, historically more defensive sectors underperforming since the peak and even since uh, the, the low and even in the corrective process that we had the mini correction we had in early May, utilities and real estate stocks, real estate stocks were underperforming. We started to see cyclical rotation into energy uh, as well as selected industrials and materials. So we're waiting on that final indicator in the form of breadth 
but we are nearly out of the woods on technicals. Now, why do we believe so much in technicals at this stage of the cycle? Mostly because markets almost always bottom before recessions end and before you get an earnings trough. I show in this particular graph or chart uh, market bottoms in relation to recessions ends over the last nearly 100 years. And you can see in every single case except for one, stocks bottomed at least 100 days before the recession ended. Uh, so it's really quite customary for stocks to bottom in anticipation of a recession end. You can have anywhere between 100 days before the recession ends or even up to a full year before the recession ends, as was the case in the Great Depression. Stocks also tend to bottom before EPS bottoms. I think we, as uh, you know, you may or may not know, I tend to practice a strategy of combining several different disciplines. We look at fundamentals as well as technical analysis and quantitative analysis to derive our, our expectation for the equity market. But I do think we tend to get caught up in what's happening in the broader economy, what's happening in the broader earnings stream, and tend to over attribute current events without uh, really having any confidence that we're going to find our way out of the economic malaise or the economic difficulties. But the market is remarkably good at doing this. This shows you in this graph over history, the vast majority of experiences since the 1950s have included a market advance in advance of the earnings trough. As a matter of fact, on average, markets start to rise about 130 days before earnings finally hit their bottom. Uh, so if that's the case, then stocks may have started rising in March. You can count out on your own, 130 days from March would be a recession bottom sometime in, or an earnings bottom sometime in the third quarter uh, before we start to dig our way higher. It's also, I think, important to note at this stage uh, of the cycle that stocks are not the same as GDP. They never have been, never will be the same as GDP. Stocks have advanced much more than the uh, broader nominal GDP advance in the last several cycles. As a matter of fact, every cycle since the 1940s, except for the 60s and 70s, when we were contending with a very different inflationary environment, Stocks have advanced uh, at a much faster pace and a much greater to a much greater degree than GDP. This has been especially prevalent in the 90s cycle, in the 80s cycle, in the last 10 years. Stocks advanced uh, significantly more than nominal GDP. I would argue that's in large in large part due to the inflation and interest rate uh, landscape that supported equity advancement. Uh, we saw continuous profit margin expansion over the course of that 40 year or so period. And that absolutely has contributed to much greater S&P 500 gains relative to uh, nominal GDP as well. A Couple of things with respect to the current crisis. Um, you'll notice a lot of my slides are about this sort of what to expect given where we are with the economy, because I think again, we are very, very captivated with the broader economic situation, particularly considering how difficult and devastating it is for many industries. Um, but frankly, there is actually no relationship uh, that I can identify in history that suggests that a deeper GDP decline necessarily has to equate with a deeper market decline. I think this is one of those interesting misnomers in markets that the deeper your economic recession, the deeper your equity decline needs to be. That's actually not the case in history. As you can see in this graph, there's, there's simply nearly no relationship between GDP and market declines historically. However, what there is a relationship between is uh, market declines and recession durations. So what we do find is the longer the recession experience, the deeper the market decline. I, and this is somewhat counterintuitive, I find, when I'm talking with investors who want to attribute immediately, you know, 30 percent unemployment rates and extraordinary GDP declines in a very, very short term period as indicative of a necessary extraordinary market correction. We had a roughly 30 percent correction. That's nearly equivalent to the correction that we had in the 48-49 experience which also happened to be something of a more average length uh, recession. 
if we start to continue to see, or we start to see some economic reopenings and we get back to work and we start to see a general improvement in activity by the end of this year, early next year, the coronavirus recession will be one of the shortest on record. Uh, which would suggest that your overall market decline, if this analysis is at, at all relevant, uh, should be actually somewhat muted. So a 30% decline you would expect considering that duration of recession is actually quite reasonable. Uh, in our view, we started writing about this in um, early March, the, the stock market started to price at its low, finally did price about a 25% decline in overall earnings over the course of uh, the recession experience. That happens to be exactly what analysts are forecasting at this moment in time. It's greater than your average recession of 20%, um, but I do think that we've done a pretty good job of pricing through that immediate three-week absolute crash in stocks. We did a pretty good job of pricing what is the most likely outcome of this recession, which is a short but very sharp uh, experience. The other thing that we talk about a lot these days, and we certainly started to note this in mid-March, is you simply cannot ignore the policy input and the extraordinary impact that policymakers have historically had on stocks and will continue to have, in my opinion. This chart shows you one of the biggest differences, in my opinion, between this crisis and the crisis of 2008-2009 or indeed even the crisis of the Great Depression, as I'll show you in a moment, is the extraordinary, extraordinarily rapid and robust policy response. What we find historically is that very often stocks find their bottoms right around the time that policymakers get their sea legs. They start throwing massive policy support at the economy. We saw this in March. Uh, but it was extremely early. I mean, it's historically unprecedented for us to have a policy response before we even had our negative economic data come out. Good examples are in 2008 and 2009, we were in recession for nearly an entire year before we saw our first uh, effort at quantitative easing. We got the Treasury Asset Repurchase Program in October of 2008. We had quantitative easing first initiated in November of 2008. And then finally, right before the market bottomed in March of 2009, we had the uh, fiscal package, the gigantic fiscal package passed by the Obama administration in February 2009. Very similarly, if you even go back to the Great Depression, Stocks found their bottom almost precise, precisely when the Fed first started experimenting with quantitative easing. I don't know that it's necessarily very well known, but for two quarters in 1932, the Federal Reserve did do open market purchases of U.S. Treasury bonds. It just so happens that stocks found their bottom almost precisely with the point in time when the Fed started open market purchases and then found a second low uh, at FDR's inauguration when we were clearly going to see gigantic federal efforts to initiate uh, economic spending or an initiate uh, spending that would uh, hopefully engage economic conditions. Notably, uh, in both the 2008-2009 experience as well as the 1932-33 experiences, stocks bottomed significantly in advance of economic conditions. 32-33 is the best example. The unemployment rate didn't peak until May 1933, a full year after stocks had already bottomed in 1932. It peaked at an extraordinarily high level, obviously, uh, of 25%, but nonetheless, I think it is very telling that in both of these extreme experiences, policymakers did effectively create a floor for stocks. And it's my view that given the fact that the Fed is committed to doubling the balance sheet, purchasing any number of assets under the sun, uh, as well as the enormous fiscal package that we've had, which equates to 10% of GDP, we're more than likely, we've more than likely experienced our massive policy bazooka that has at least created a major low for equities. Now, in terms of how far can we go from here, uh, we do some scenario analysis looking at where the fair value for the equity market is in a number of different scenarios. Uh, we have a 50% economy, which effectively says over the course of the 12 months following the second quarter low 
in earnings, we'll get about half the pace of average earnings growth that we have normally had in a recovery following recessions. That's the 50% economy dot, which takes us to about 3,300 on the S&P 500. It's clearly below our former peak levels of 3,400, but nonetheless, it does support a continued advance in equities into the next 12 months, provided we get half the average recovery. Now, if we get the average recovery in earnings that we've experienced in the first 12 months after recession, we should surpass former peaks uh, within the next 12 months. Uh, on the other hand, if we have an extended recession, and a recession that lasts into 2021, where we're continuously seeing declining earnings, accelerating negative uh, economic activity, we may very well go back to test our mark, March lows. But it does take that extended recession experience for us to get back to even testing the March lows, which I think is important to consider. Now, how do we come to these conclusions? We do run a PE model uh, that is a re regression model, assuming different scenarios for interest rates as well as corporate credit spreads and long-term 24-month earnings growth. And you can see that in any situation in our model, we're supported at a trailing PE of somewhere between 18 and 22 times earnings. Our base case scenario says, look, the Fed has been extraordinarily accommodative we're probably gonna get some incremental improvement in the yield curve spread over the course of the next 12 months. But we're gonna be really conservative in how much we think mid-grade corporate credit can improve from here or EPS growth can, can, can improve from here. And the result is still nearly 22 times trailing earnings because of that extraordinary accommodation from the Fed and because interest rates are so very, very low. In the recession scenario, of course, we take a, a much different tack and suggest that two-year yields go back to their all-time low levels. Uh, we assume that you get no earnings growth over the 24-month period, and we assume further widening in mid-grade corporate credit spreads. And you're still, because of those extremely low interest rates, supported at a multiple of about 18 times earnings. Now we did put out this gigantic table and uh, if you wanna have a copy of this, you're more than welcome to it. Just basically saying, okay, pick your pleasure because most people look at our 22 times earnings number and they say, no way, stocks should never trade at 22 times earnings. I can't possibly pay that much for stocks. Even though interest rates are at all time lows, there is a lot of denial that valuations should reflect those low levels of interest rates. So if you think instead that a fair multiple on stocks is something like 18 times, you have a very different sort of scenario. You've got to get to greater than 10% earnings growth over the course of the next year or so in order to see a fair value, even just a few, uh, a few basis points or a few points below where we are on the S&P 500. But just for information, this gives you a sense. If we get even earnings contraction of 2% the 12 months following uh, second quarter lows at our 22 handle on the S&P 500, we're still looking at 3,100 for a fair value for the S&P 500 over the course of the next 12 months. In terms of how earnings have historically performed, this is a table that tells you uh, the change in earnings in the year into the low, followed by the change in earnings the year out of the low. You could see that experiences are very, very vast pretty wide array of experiences. Most of them are double digit recoveries and earnings. Uh, you do tend to see the bigger the, dro the drop, the bigger the recovery, uh, which I think is an interesting corollary for today. Uh, we did put out a note on the Bloomberg terminal today kind of talking about the fact that even in a really, really modest economic recovery, you're gonna see a V in earnings. V doesn't mean massive economic growth. It means comps get easy and you're gonna see some degree of, of uh, improvement. Right now, the consensus is anticipating a 40% drop in earnings on year over year basis in the second quarter. That's historically unprecedented. Uh, at least not in, uh, in, in recent times have we seen a single quarter with such devastating results. Uh, so just by that very nature, even some modest improvement in economic activity by the time you get to this time next year is going to look like extraordinary growth. Uh, the forward PE is shown on this graph and I show this because I do think there are some misnomers as to uh, 
how stocks have historically traded. Most of us sort of you know, really started in the era or worked through um, most of the era shown on this graph. And we saw certainly um, a, a really relatively low valuation market occur from 2002 right through to 2009. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways, our historical perspective is skewed by that experience when stocks were trading at below average multiples. And so we naturally think, well, what, do, what should you pay for stocks? Most of us, I think, would say you should pay 15 times earnings. Why do we say 15 times earnings? Because that's the long term average. Um, but in reality, PEs move all over the place and they tend to trend. And we've been in an environment in which PE has, PE has been generally trending higher for the vast majority of this cycle. Uh, so to suggest that PEs need to revert to 15 on a dime because it's the long-term average, I think it's a little bit of one of these market lures, frankly. And I find that looking at the equity risk premium and looking at interest rates uh, to derive your expectations for PE just provides you with a little bit better analysis. The other thing that I think um, often happens in the midst of recessions is investors somehow get anchored on numbers. And the one that I've heard thrown around in both this recession as well as the last recession is stocks should trade to 10 times earnings in recessions or they're not worth looking at. And as a matter of fact, when you look back at recessions of the past and you look at PE trough levels, uh, what you do find is that recessions end at all sorts of different levels of PE. You can see that the trough level has ranged from anywhere such as levels of the eight, 1980, mid 70s, early 80s, which were all below 10, to all the way near 20, which was the 2001 recession end level. Um, you also t tend to find that trough levels that are lower do see a little bit of a bigger PE bounce. So what should we expect in this experience? We don't need to go to 10. It's probably more about what happens with interest rates. But we didn't see a tremendous PE decline. We didn't see PEs go to much lower levels. So maybe we won't see massive PE expansion on the other end of this. <clears throat> what we do find though, and this I think is also quite interesting, is PE recoveries do tend to happen in mass with bigger GDP declines. Uh, this chart shows you the relationship between declines in economic growth and recovery in valuation multiples over time. And you can see this is a stronger relationship than this. Uh, which I find very in entertaining. Uh, you know, you have the 2001 experience where you pretty much got no PE recovery, but you also almost had no decline. And you had the 2007, 2009 experience where you had a massive GDP decline and a much bigger PE recovery. So some told, I do think that historical experience is relevant. Um, I think the PE recovery will largely depend on a couple of factors, but most likely where interest rates head over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. And what we've seen is a pretty significant reset in interest rates, as well as a massive expansion in liquidity that most likely supports reasonable valuations uh, over the core for the equity market. Here's the equity risk premium, which really is just the earnings yield on the S&P 500 compared to the earnings, or excuse me, the yield on the 10-year treasury or the corporate credit yield. And you can see that in either case, uh, the equity risk premium is still near record levels uh, or at its highest levels, excluding um, the 2011 debt, European debt crisis, as well as the uh, 1970s experience of um, relatively rapid inflation and rising interest rates. So we do have a tremendous risk premium still in the equity market, even trading at valuation levels that we're at today. A lot of chatter in the markets about bankruptcy risk. Uh, so we did some analysis on bankruptcy risk and leverage. Um, I mentioned that highly levered stocks are now outperforming low leverage stocks. One of the reasons for that is uh, because 
bankruptcies were largely priced. If you take a look at this graph, you can see very clearly how Altman Z scores relate to price to book for the S&P 500 sectors. We did the same analysis for all of the stocks in the S&P 500. So if you're interested in seeing that, we can certainly send it your way. But with very few outliers, the market did appear to price a significant amount of bankruptcy risk in certain spaces and reasonably appropriately price it as well. So this explains why leverage has suddenly recovered. The other thing that I think, or why high leverage has suddenly recovered relative to low leverage, the other thing I think is notable is in the period of time over the three weeks in uh, the crisis crash, we priced nearly the, the degree of bankruptcy risk that we did throughout the entire decline in 2008 and 2009. So we have gone a long way. It, it feels crazy that it all happened in three weeks. I understand that, but we have to respect that the market itself just viciously adjusted and adjusted to the risks that exist uh, to the downside for the most part. Here's our list of discounted stocks with low bankruptcy risk. This list can be expanded um, and you're welcome to do so on your Bloomberg terminal. You can go and, and look for this. I can send it to you. Uh, whatever you might like. But these are the stocks that we found when we did just a simple screen looking at above average Altman Z scores, so lower bankruptcy risk, combined with uh, reasonable debt ratios and reasonable valuations relative to long-term average for each of the stocks. I want to talk a little bit about FANG because it has become obviously a, a hot topic what we think will happen over the course of the next 12 months is that the FANG premium will start to shrink. It doesn't mean that the FANG stocks valuations are too high, but it does mean that there's plenty of room for X fang stocks to catch up in terms of multiples. You can see the remarkable re-rating that's occurred so far since the Fed announced their, uh, the Fed and the federal government announced their policy changes in uh, March and April. Um, you can also see how much non-FANG stocks have started to catch up with FANG stocks. There still is a record, record wide premium for FANG, but it's highly concentrated in just a few of those FANG names. Uh, it also reflects what's happening in earnings. And that is the FAMIC stocks or FANG stocks have much more stable earnings growth conditions than the rest of the index. Well, if you look out over the forecast horizon, that earnings premium for FAMIG or FANG is expected to shrink as some of the cyclical beaten down stocks start to see some earnings growth into 2021. That in and of itself will most likely shrink the valuation premium. We saw this in 2002 and 2009 where all stocks re-rated after major recession lows. And you can see this in the graph, quintile one and quintile five of valuations stocks in the S&P 500 re-rated in that first year of recovery, but the cheapest stocks re-rate more. And that's very consistent throughout time. It's something that we expect to happen. Not all FAMIC stocks are in that Q1, that expensive stocks group, but they're not, none of them are in Q5. <laughs> none of them are cheap stocks at this point in the S&P 500. So I would expect the valuation gap to close as some of the cheaper uh, stocks, some of the low valuation stocks in the index play a little bit of catch up. Now in terms of size and sectors and factors, um, we have a little bit of an alternative view on uh, small caps and I apologize, this chart's a little bit dated because small caps are now retesting uh, their April peaks, but nonetheless, uh, our view is that the Fed really changed the game for small caps in April. Uh, and again, I don't ignore the Fed for the broad market. I don't think you want to ignore the Fed for your size allocation either. But one of the most consistent indicators historically of small cap performance relative to large is the option adjusted spread on high yield bonds. And the fact that high yield bonds made a massive peak in March and have generally recovered and have recovered even more as a result of the Fed's direct um, intervention in the corporate credit markets, would suggest to us it's very highly unlikely we go back to test those, high, those peaks 
Now, over the last several cycles, every time high yield or every time high yield credit spreads have made a major peak and started to recover off those peaks, small caps have outperformed large caps. And on average, small caps have outperformed large caps by 1,200 basis points in the year following those major peaks. So if you have any conviction at all that high yield spreads have probably made their wide, you probably should be looking into the size factor. You should be looking into small cap stocks as an opportunity, um, much more so than you were uh, a, a month or two ago, especially considering the Fed commitment to purchasing high yield credit. There has been a bit of front running on this trade. We just want to acknowledge the fact that flows into high yield have been extremely supportive. They've followed the lead of the Fed. Um, we haven't really seen a ton of slowdown in this. Nonetheless, uh, it is at least worth noting that the market itself adjusted pretty quickly to this idea that the Fed would be purchasing high grade credit, high yield and high grade credit. And the result of that may be we already saw the vast majority of our credit spread improvement. That said, if spreads don't go back to testing those former peaks, the conditions are still generally pretty supportive for some of these small caps. Uh, the other thing supporting the small cap case, I, you know, I don't believe in valuations as a timing mechanism necessarily. I did mention that they, um, that they do tend to trend. However, small caps gap to large caps in terms of multiples is at the highest we've seen on record on recent records. This is EV to uh, forward sales for the small cap universe relative to the S&P 500. And you can see it's about two standard deviations below long-term average. So we have reached an extreme on this valuation metric and it's an extreme worth paying attention to particularly considering that you now have a trigger uh, to potentially close that gap. Our scorecard is really for the S&P 500. We run this sector scorecard that combines, is entirely quantitative, I should note. It co combines price momentum, price breadth, earnings trend, revision breadth, and relative value uh, categories into um, one and gives you an overall composite score for all 11 sectors of the S&P 500. I ran this in last in mid-February, so we updated it in mid-February. That means we're due for an update now because we run it every three months, so certainly look for that. For those of you who are Bloomberg clients, we will run this next week um, at the end of earnings season to get a sense of how our sector allocation has changed. Uh, but over the last three months, we've sort of, uh, the, the model had, had guided us in February to be in healthcare technology and staples. Um, frankly, I'm pretty proud that it did so, even though we certainly weren't necessarily pricing a COVID experience in February. The conditions of price momentum and breadth, earnings trend and revision breadth, as well as relative value, all did suggest that you wanted to rotate into this sort of um, growthy stability uh, trade and away from cyclicals. Uh, we'll see where it ends up going for May. I would say that uh, the factor signals have suggested, however, that we might start to consider things like low value, or I'm sorry, high value, low valuation, high value stocks, uh, more junk as opposed to quality, more high volatility as opposed to low volatility. What we show in this chart is the Bloomberg Pure Factor portfolios and how they've performed over time. All of the vertical lines are stock market lows. And I think you can see relatively clearly on this chart that at every major low, you have a reversal. And the biggest reversals historically are in profitability and volatility. So the risk in our sector strategy is that we are in relatively high quality and relatively low volatility stocks. But at this point in the cycle, if we have indeed made our low, we should see low profitability and high volatility stocks outperforming. And indeed, that's what we've seen over the course of the last two months. These types of stocks have started to, are, started to outperform. That may erode that sort of quality tilt in sector strategy over time. And that's something we're going to be conscious of and on guard for as we look out into the next couple of weeks and then the next couple of quarters. Just for some perspective, lots of numbers on this chart. It makes even me dizzy looking at it. But nonetheless, a couple of things really um, 
strike me on this graph, the first is, or on this table, the first is the volatility column. Notice in every experience after major market lows, volatility outperforms for the first three months. It outperforms by a pretty wide, and this is high vol, outperforms low vol by a pretty wide margin. Very similarly, profitability at the top of the graph, high profitability stocks underperform low profitability stocks in that first month period, and they have in every single market experience um, of, off of major lows over the last, call it 11 years now. Uh, you also tend to see the duration of outperformance extend for profitability. This is something that I'm a little bit worried about is positioning right now is absolutely in favor of high quality, higher momentum, lower volatility stocks. And those positions are at risk of underperformance. It doesn't mean those stocks are going to fall because out of major market lows, generally all stocks rise. But what it does mean is that they may not perform as well as some of the lower profitability, lower momentum, sort of the reversal kinds of trades. Now, one last thing I wanted to talk about, let me just check the time to make sure I do have a few minutes. Yes, one last thing I wanted to talk about, um, which is sort of our outside the box call, is uh, the notion that we may be due for an inflation regime change over the course of the next decade. And uh, the reason I'm calling this out is because I do think that we are currently, as a consensus and as an equity um, investor universe, entirely focused on the inevitable deflation, um, the inevitable drop, how long it's gonna take to dig our way out of this coronavirus experience. Um, and as a result, I think the vast majority of positioning is to anticipate a persistence of deflation or maybe in a best case scenario, disinflation. And yet, if you look at the macro factors, the macro environment is lining up to suggest that we very well may be setting ourselves up for a very different inflation regime. So let me go through the case for uh, a potential shift in inflation that we really should be on guard for. Number one um, point to make is that imports and inflation go hand in hand. And we've been in an environment in which we've been deglobalizing just defined by trade as a share of GDP, or in this chart, imports as a share of GDP. We saw globalization really hit its peak back in 2008. Perhaps by coincidence, but I don't think it's mere coincidence. I, I think it's consistent that as we've started to see a bit of deglobalization, as we've started to see imports as a share of GDP falling, we've also started to actually see C CPI inching higher. So if we have this environment of deglobalization already, you pile on that with some of the trade negotiations and the trade policy changes that have been occurring since 2018. You pile on top of that a natural tendency for countries potentially to be um, slightly more controlled or want to onshore more production for safety purposes or um, you know, generally want to be more protectionist in nature as a result of blame being thrown around uh, with respect to coronavirus, the result may very well be simply through uh, deglobalization and maybe even an, ex a, an acceleration in deglobalization, a period of even higher consumer prices. Secondly, I think the coronavirus itself, itself may lend to um, a supply chain diversity sort of push that results in much higher input costs. This chart just shows that you have uh, OECD um, economic um, competitiveness indexes, which is effectively just wages. And you could see wages for China and the white line substantially below competitors such as Korea and Mexico. Uh, so if we do have sort of this natural need to diversify supply chains, be less concentrated in China, which is where the, the you know, a significant portion of cheap labor still exists, what will that do to cost? What will that do to margin? What will that do 
uh, to the ultimate inflation um, uh, result. And I would argue if we do see diversification of supply chains, it probably will increase cost and probably will ultimately get fed through to the consumer. Uh, certainly the policy input right now is all about fighting that deflationary concern, but it, it, let's not forget that just before we decided to shut down economies, we were looking at all-time high levels of employment, and there is a pretty significant relationship um, between full employment and inflation conditions, especially if policy is extraordinarily accommodative. We've got a Fed that's going to more than double their balance sheet. And we've experienced a tremendous increase in federal spending as a share of GDP. Uh, so this may feed its way through to inflation ultimately if it's not rolled back appropriately as we start to recover. And I'm not saying that the policymakers can't roll it back, um, but I do think that especially on the federal side, it's going to be pretty tough to catch back up. Uh, monetary policymakers, I would have a little bit more faith in their ability to potentially tighten policy reflecting inflation, but they're usually a little behind the curve there too. Um, so it's definitely not something to worry about right now as we contend with deflation, but it's something to certainly consider um, as we work our way through the coronavirus recession, as we get five, 10 years out, we might start to see this accumulated effect and the result could be a very different inflation landscape than the one that we exist in today. What does it mean for the equity market? Well, a lot of it is going to depend on how much of this inflation, all of, all of these things that I've shown you are very much cost push inflation, which is really difficult for the equity market. If we have this cost push inflation, but we also have pretty significant demand growth, the equity market could navigate it relatively well. But in an environment where you have, you know, um, significant cost push and relatively slow GDP growth, that's not a great case for stocks at large. So I think it could go either way. I want to acknowledge that I don't have a lot of visibility <laughs> with respect to that. But one thing we do know is that inflation expectations in energy stocks go pretty close to hand in hand. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we may see is a significant rotation. If we do start to see inflation conditions uh, change, we most likely will see rotation into some of the commodity sensitive groups in the index, like the financial, or sorry, like the energy and materials, some selected industrials that tend to benefit from rising um, inflation expectations, rising commodity costs as a result of some of those supply constraints. And that's it for my prepared remarks. Um, as you can see, there's lots of ways to access our work. On your terminal, you can go to BI Space STOX Go. You're welcome to subscribe to my work. Just find me on the terminal uh, and click for alerts on our research. Um, you can also listen in on our weekly macro our weekly macro call, which is every Monday morning at 8:30 a.m. Eastern Time. And then we do a lot of videos, uh, webinars, and podcasts on the terminal as well. And like any good former sell side strategist, I also have a distribution list so I can push my work to you if you're interested. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open it up to Q&A. Gina, thanks so much for the insightful presentation. I, I see a number of uh, questions already coming into the Q&A. Um, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I'm going to try to get through as many as we can. Um, if there are some additional questions uh, that come up, please feel free to continue to enter those, but we're going to try to work through as many as we can. So with that, um, one of the more popular questions, um, uh, Gina, it seems you have a relatively optimistic sentiment for the market and that from your analysis, we have found the bottom in the equity market. What risks and metrics are you watching that may indicate an extended recovery or further recession? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, we're in this bizarre world where really the only thing that seems to matter is the infection rates. So I, like everybody else, I'm watching the daily infection rates um, for risk that they reaccelerate and create another wave of shutdowns. Certainly, that's, I would say, the number one uh, indicator to watch because that would imply that maybe the forecast, which currently is for second quarter to be the bottom, the consensus then thinks we can kind of claw our way out of that low with three and a half percent growth over 12 months. 
that forecast would even prove too optimistic if we head into another shutdown experience. Um, so I'm definitely watching shutdowns. I watch the market like a hawk for its internal cues though as well. I mean, little things like momentum, even in the, after the April peak and we went through two weeks of sort of consolidation in May, RSI momentum never fell below 50, which you know, as long as you've got momentum that stays in the, the upper end of its range, you're, you're in a bull trend by definition. So you wanna watch momentum. If momentum starts to truly turn over, then maybe you're turning over into something more than just a consolidation and into a true correction. I also watch breadth. Again, breadth never went back to test its mid-range. You still had, even though we had this sort of mini consolidation, you still had more than 60% of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average. As long as that number doesn't go below 50%, you're still in an uptrend. You're still working your way uh, a little bit higher. I also watch the stock market itself. The 50-day moving average on the S&P 500 has been the line that I've been calling out. You want to get technically above the 200-day to reestablish a longer-term uptrend, but as long as we're trading above that 50-day moving average, I think that you're still in pretty decent um, technical condition. It's tricky at this stage of the cycle because you can't watch the economic numbers. The economic numbers are too lagged. They're all except for maybe initial claims, which at some point we're going to start to watch continuing claims because those should start to improve. But everything else is a completely lagged indicator. And until you get past second quarter, it doesn't need to start to show improvement because the analyst estimates imply that you're going to see a 40% crash in earnings in the second quarter already. To get greater than a 40%, we'd have to have a full-on shutdown again. And I think that's really unlikely in the very short run. Your risks don't come up until you get into the third or fourth quarter economically. So I think you have to hug the technicals, you have to hug the signals and sectors and factors pretty, pretty carefully given where we are in this economic cycle. Thanks so much. Um, kind of along this uh, same lines on the broader perspective, there's some comments that you know, we understand that the technical suggests that the bear market is over, but doesn't the market seem a bit divorced from the fundamentals, just in particular given how quickly we've seen the economy um, contract? Um, how does the market uh, get off kind of so scot-free? Yeah, I had hoped that I answered that question, but I guess I didn't. I mean, I, you know, this is what I have spent the last eight weeks writing about is you cannot expect stocks and the economy to trade in tandem at this stage in the cycle. It's not realistic. Stocks always bottom before fundamentals bottom. They always bottom before GDP bottoms. They always bottom before earnings bottom. And in most cases, they bottom at least three months, if not longer, before earnings and fundamentals make their lows. So you have to have some sort of acknowledgement of policy change, of interest rates changing as the primary drivers of stocks at this stage of the cycle. When, you, when we get six months out, if we're not starting to see fundamental improvement, then we start to get in trouble because then we say the stock market went too early. The stock market preceded this economic recovery way in advance. And that even depends upon what policymakers are doing. And the Fed seems to be very clear that in the event we need more, they will do more. Will the fiscal government do more? In the event we do, do more, we need more, we don't know. But we do know that the Fed is certainly on the side of the equity market. And I think that's extremely important to acknowledge. So yes, stock market gets away scot-free because every cycle the stock market gets away scot-free for a certain amount of time because the stock market priced extraordinary weakness in a very, very short period of time, I think we're in this sort of mental conundrum that's much greater than usual because it felt like we didn't price anything. But in reality, a 30% drop in three weeks priced a lot of weakness. Um, it didn't price extended weakness. And that is absolutely a risk is if we're in this recession and we're looking at persistent it's persistently worsening economic conditions for a much longer period of time, then we'll have to reassess where we think stocks are going. But that's not the base case scenario. The base case scenario is this will be a relatively short 
it will reach some sort of economic trough by this summer, and then we'll start to claw our way out. And I think that that's what the market is trying to price. There were a number of questions that came in on sectors. I think I think you were able to touch on some of those within the presentation, but but one in particular um, that talked that asked you for your view on on pharma and biotech uh, the sector um, and the ups and downs in relation to uh, a vaccine. Yeah, uh, a lot of volatility, potentially a lot of overpricing, anticipation of a vaccine. However. The earnings stability available in that sector is second only to tech um, and very close to what's available in consumer staples as well. And that's why it's toward the top of our scorecard. I, we're going to reassess sectors again over the course of the next week, as I mentioned. And I am a little bit worried that you're going to see the valuation component of our scorecard trigger negative for healthcare because we have seen enough re rating in that sector to anticipate, um, you know, blockbuster drugs uh, and also as investors have tried to hide in areas that are relatively reasonably supported um, from an earnings perspective. But the price momentum is still very, very strong. The earnings momentum is still pretty consistent. Uh, and that those are the reasons why healthcare as a whole is still at the top of our scorecard. Thanks, Gina. Um, um, on value and growth, can you talk a little bit about your view on value versus growth and um, has value investing seen its better days? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, what we've actually seen over the course of the last two months is value stocks starting to outperform. Um, now, I, I don't look at value versus growth so much as I look at uh, long short value versus long short quality or a long short momentum. Um, because I have a quant on my team who tells me I can't look at just value growth. I have to consider this from a pet factor perspective. Uh, but what I will say is what we're seeing, that a couple of things. The first is the long short value factor is starting to outperform. <clears throat> it's not consistent um, and it's not as powerful as say the long short volatility factor reversal or the long short profitability factor reversal. And I think a big reason for that is because inflation expectations have not hooked higher. Um, so you probably do need to see some form of uh, improvement in inflation expectations before you get a really durable long-term period of outperformance for value. Also, when we look at value, uh, the cheap stocks are actually not that cheap. The value sort of valuation spread argument that everybody makes, and this will come out in a Factor Friday report that we'll put out on Friday, but the, the valuation argument that everybody makes about value stocks specifically is really built upon the foundation that growth stocks are expensive. So what you find when you decompose value and you take all the stocks in the index and you take the cheapest stocks, compare them to the most expensive stocks, the cheapest stocks are actually only in the 33rd percentile of history. They're not actually that cheap. Small caps are in the 10% of history, right? So they're cheap. But value stocks are not, cheap value is not that cheap. What's really happening is expensive valuation stocks are extremely expensive. They're in like the 95th percentile of history. So that's making the value, it's distorting the value picture a little bit. Uh, and it's creating what is perceived to be a big opportunity in value, but the reality is what you need is a reversal in those expensive stocks to make value as an investment strategy defined by a long, short work. Um, now, broadly, if I'm to put my hat on, you know, how I thought about value and growth before I had a quant on my team 10 years ago, a couple of things really matter for value to perform well relative to growth. And this, for this perspective, we're only talking about the longs a long value versus long growth. For long value to work versus long growth, you need two things. You need a reversal, positive reversal in ISM. So we need to reach finally our low on that manufacturing survey and start to see uh, an improvement in the manufacturing survey. And you also really need to see positive estimate revision start to improve for the value stocks. As simplistic as it sounds, what I find over long-term cycles is growth stocks outperform when growth stocks are producing faster earnings growth. Value stocks outperform when value stocks are producing faster earnings growth. I mean, let's face it, they're all stocks. They all trade upon perceived uh, future potential earnings growth. 
So why did value stocks outperform last cycle? Because value stocks produced the faster earnings growth than growth stocks did from 2002 to 2007. Growth stocks have produced faster growth than value stocks over the course of this year or the last 10 years. So we need to see something reversed there. Uh, and just revisions in a short run can create a pop for value. It is, I think, starting to get priced already that you'll start to see an improvement in revision momentum for those value stocks. I mean, it's not hard to imagine, for instance, that energy sector earnings are going to get better after negative $30 oil uh, in the current quarter. So they'll probably get better a year from now, and that's starting to get priced in the market. Gina, do you, do you or does Bloomberg have any data on cash flow valuation of the S&P 500 and free cash flow yield? I do, but I unfortunately don't have it put to memory. We started, we actually started talking a lot about cash flow and cash in our earnings report today. We noted just how much free cash flow has fallen and how much cash stores have risen as companies have really focused on shoring up the balance sheet and um, sort of focused on liquidity and cash preservation strategies. I have not looked at free cash flow yield um, in quite some time, so I would need to look at it. I'm sure it's horrific because cash flow, we've experienced just a tremendous drop in cash flow and we're going to continue to experience it um, in the second quarter. Switching gears a little bit, um, will investors still use high yield dividend stocks as a replacement for bonds or is that now over? Mm. It's a really, really good question. Um, something I actually haven't thought about in quite a, quite some time. I. It seems that we are going away from that, at least in the short run. And the reason I say that is because even though bond yields have stayed very, very low over the course of the last three months, utilities and real estate stocks have underperformed. And that may be simply a function of the earnings landscape and um, liquidity landscape. Uh, their debt um, is certainly part of that story as well. They tend to be higher debt organizations. So the idea that they may not be, um, they may not have the liquidity, they may have higher bankruptcy risk, uh, may be embedded in the, in the current landscape for utilities and real estate. Instead, it's shifted to where dividends are perceived as more stable, which means investors are using consumer staples and healthcare to a lesser degree. But nonetheless, consumer staples and healthcare stocks also have reasonable dividend yields and relatively safe dividend yields. Uh, so I would say it still exists that investors want dividends, but div dividends are more scarce. And as bankruptcy risks rise, they're becoming more specific about where they find those dividends. Uh, and naturally seeking the safer entities. I have a, there were a number of questions on um, uh, deflation versus inflation. I think you addressed a, a number of them. A couple that were up, um, this is in particular regarding your views about deglobalization and inflation. With inflation being higher due to deglobalization, can we expect to see wages be higher and unemployment be lower as a result? to the cost push inflation um, in sectors outside of energy? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> and I don't honestly know the answer. Um, frankly, I don't think wages are gonna go higher in, you know, companies are incentivized, public companies are very much incentivized to grow profits. So they're going to be incentivized uh, to keep wages relatively low as one of the biggest cost inputs. Um, however, if we're erecting border controls and mandating that companies have operations in the United States and they want to still achieve, you know, production to reach an end market, they're going to be forced to pay higher wages to some degree. And I do think that's actually a possibility. This is not something we've had to talk about for a very long time, but Things like telling Taiwan semiconductors that they can no longer manufacture in China, they can no longer sell, you know, product to Huawei and they have to relocate plants would tell you that's the direction we're starting to lean. Um, so I think it's a possibility. I don't think it's a high probability, but I think it's, an, uh, it's a possibility and it's something we have not really thought of as a possibility up until the last few years. <laughs> 
Can you talk a little bit about your views on potential factor reversals for international stocks? Oh, I wish I could, but I don't, I, I haven't done the work on um, factor reversals in non-domestic stocks. I actually just hired an Asia quant to join my team this summer. So you can look forward to having that from us. Um, but we don't have that right now and we, we don't even have it for Europe yet. We've focused really more on the fundamental um, strategy side in our build in Europe. So I'm unfortunately ill prepared to answer that question. Maybe one final question before, before we let you go and, and thank everybody for, for attending. Again, this is kind of more of a, a general question. Um, you know, this rally is more technical than anything related to fundamentals. Further, there's a major dislocation in the market and what industries companies are leading versus lagging this rebound from the potential bottom. How do you envision the large unemployment factoring into the rebound as some of these companies who furloughed workers will cease to exit or exist further putting stress on unemployment findings? Yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely something we worry about with every cycle, right? We have to worry about it more with this cycle but it says something to me that stocks bottomed a year before unemployment peaked in the great, even in the Great Depression, as unemployment was marching its way toward uh, levels that exist today, stocks were still rising. So things to think about, the stocks that are not surviving won't be in the S&P 500. That's, all, that's something to consider, right? They will move to the lower indices or they will cease to exist. Um, and so you got to be careful what you're buying, but if you're buying the companies that survive, um, you're most likely going to see reasonable returns over the next 12 months because of the policy input, irrespective of the fact that the unemployment rate is extraordinarily high and the economy is going through an incredible transition. Um, we've been through extraordinary conditions before, and it's hard to see. Um, when you're in it, it's hard to see how you work your way out of it. It's hard to see how the economy survives and rotates, but little things are already happening. Um, auto sales hit their low in China back in February, are still falling, but are falling roughly 15% as opposed to 70%. In the U.S., auto sales hit their low of a 60% drop. They're now falling roughly 25%, and most analysts are saying uh, within the next month, we'll be down single digits year over year. So we are already starting to see those incremental improvements. Um, and you'll see a lot of destruction. That's just how this economy works. Destruction occurs and we rebuild and we rebuild for a new future. Gina, thank you so much for speaking with us today. And, and thank you everyone that joined the webinar and for all the great questions. We had so many come in, I'm so sorry we didn't get to all, we weren't able to get to all of them. If you have any other questions about today's event, please do contact the CFA Society Chicago at info at cfachicago.org. Again, uh, thank you so much, Gina, for the presentation today and, um, and uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you.